on Monday, we talked a lot about variational inference and how to optimize for uh, complex distributions of data. And today, we're going to actually put some of that into practice in the context of meta-learning algorithms. Um, and so specifically, we'll again try to motivate why we might want Bayesian meta-learning algorithms in the first place. Then we'll talk about different classes of Bayesian meta-learning algorithms, including black box meta-learning algorithms and optimization-based algorithms. Uh, and then lastly, we'll talk about how to actually evaluate uh, Bayesian meta-learning algorithms and how that differs from the typical kind of few-shot learning evaluation that we've seen previously in class. Uh, and so the goals for by the end of the lecture are to try to be able to understand um, the interpretation as meta of meta-learning as Bayesian inference and also understand techniques for representing uncertainty over parameters versus over predictions. Um, so I guess also one quick disclaimer, uh, like a lot of the class content, uh, this is an active area of research, and so there are also, yeah, will be, in some cases, potentially more questions and answers in terms of the algorithms that we're looking at, um, but that's also true for, for a lot of the content we've seen in the course as well. Cool. Um, so let's start, start by talking a little bit about a recap of some of the things that we've seen so far, both in terms of meta-learning algorithms uh, and also in terms of casting that in the context of Bayesian graphical models. And so um, when we covered uh, the kind of the last lecture in, on meta-learning algorithms, we talked about the properties that we might want from a meta-learning algorithm. Um, and specifically, we were talking about the properties of the inner loop of that algorithm, like the learning procedure that it gives you. And there were two different properties that we really um, focused on when talking about this. The first was thinking about the expressive power of the inner loop of that algorithm. Uh, specifically, can the inner loop of that algorithm represent a wide range of learning procedures? Uh, and the second was looking at the consistency of that inner loop, um, which was consistency in the notion of statistical consistency, which is that if you give the inner loop enough data, can you expect it to solve the task um, and, and reach a consistent estimator of, um, or, or give you a consistent estimator of the task-specific parameters? Um, but and these properties are important, um, but one property that we haven't talked that much about is the ability to reason about uncertainty. And this is really the, the focus of Bayesian meta-learning algorithms. Uh, and by that, I mean the ability to try to reason about ambiguity that might come up in the learning process. Uh, and this is important in active learning settings, um, in settings where you want calibrated uncertainty estimates, uh, as well as in reinforcement learning settings. And it also gives us um, one might argue kind of approaches that are uh, quite principled from the Bayesian standpoint, um, insofar as they're going to be maximizing the likelihood under some graphical model. Um, cool, so um, now this will also be a little bit of recap, which is that um, actually even before we started talking about meta-learning algorithms, um, we talked about how training and testing tasks should share some degree of structure and we talked about how this can be thought of as a statistical dependence on some latent information theta. Uh, and we brought up this graphical model right here, where we have our task-specific parameters, phi i, and some shared latent information theta. Uh, and we also have the data that we can observe, which includes a support set um, denoted as x train and x and y train here, and a query set denoted as x test and y test here. Um, and we also talked about if we kind of condition on the shared information, that means that the task param parameters become independent uh, and are not otherwise independent from one another. And as a result, if you condition on, your, um, on that shared information on theta, that gives you information about phi i. And so the kind of uh, the distribution over phi i is going to have a lower entropy. It's going to have less randomness because we have um, some knowledge about the shared structure across the different tasks. Um, and then I guess it's been a while since we talked about this a little bit, so I guess we can maybe walk through these thought exercises again. So the first thought exercise was that if you can identify the metaparameters theta, um, such as with a meta-learning algorithm, um, when should you expect, when should learning phi i be 
faster than if you were to learn from scratch. Does anyone have any thoughts? When your task is formed, the same distribution as the one you used to learn theta? Yeah, so one example is if, if your task, the, the task that you're trying to learn is from the same distribution as the task that you saw during meta training, then the shared structure should be useful for helping you infer what phi i should correspond to. Any other thoughts? So one other thing that I think we covered last time is that if the tasks do share some structure, then this data is going to help you, um, is basically going to kind of re reduce your uncertainty over phi, whereas if the tasks are completely independent from one another and don't have any shared structure, then you won't actually be reducing entropy when you condition on the theta variable. Um, and then lastly, we also talked about this other case where, um, where if you condition on theta, what happens if the entropy is zero? And this is the case where theta tells you everything there is to know about the task-specific parameters. Um, and in that case, you don't actually need any support set or any data to infer what the task-specific parameters are. Um, and in this case, you could actually think of this a lot as memorization. Uh, you don't actually need the support set in order to infer the task-specific parameters. And so in this case, you, your, um, your meta-learning algorithm may just memorize all of the tasks and not actually um, use the support set. Cool. Um, and then kind of jumping into Bayesian meta-learning algorithms, um, all the algorithms that we've seen so far use some, give us our task-specific parameters in a fully deterministic way. So they'll give us a, well, they'll give us a degenerate distribution over phi i because they'll just give us one, uh, one parameter vector. They won't give us uh, a distribution that has any amount of support to it. Um, and there are cases where we do actually want to generate multiple hypotheses. And so this is uh, an example that we saw on Monday where few shot learning problems might be ambiguous. So you might have um, a support set where it's inherently unclear which attribu attributes you should be paying attention to. Um, and if we can learn to generate hypotheses about the underlying function, then this can tell us if we need more labels or if we should abstain from making a prediction on a new example uh, because it's uncertain. And so this is important in safety critical settings where you want to decide if you should make a decision, active learning settings, um, and also exploration settings. Uh, in this specific example, um, in this lecture, we will be talking about algorithms that can actually handle the specific setting and generate hypotheses and generate basically multiple classifiers, um, one that pays attention to uh, the smiling attribute, one that pays attention to the wearing hat attribute, and one that pays attention to the young versus old attribute. Cool. Um, so let's get into algorithms for doing this. Um, now the first like V0 algorithm that we could think about doing is, uh, we've seen all of these algorithms that give us kind of a label Y test given a support set and an input X test. And so what we could do is have F output the parameters of a distribution over Y test. And in the classification settings that we've done, you've already been doing that. So we're not actually like literally outputting one single label. We output the probabilities for each class. Um, and so what you've been doing so far, like in the homework, for example, is to output probability values over um, a discrete categorical distribution. But you could also output, um, output some other distribution over Y test. So in regression problems, you could output the mean invariance. Um, you could use a mixture density network, like what we talked about on Monday, where you output the means, variances, and weights uh, for a mixture of Gaussians over Y test. Um, or if you have something more multidimensional, you could have an auto have kind of this output over Y test be uh, a sequence of distributions, such as an autoregressive model. Um, and then once you choose your distribution class over Y test, then you can just optimize. Um, with maximum likelihood, um, and that would, like, maximum likelihood would correspond to the outer loss of your meta-learning algorithm. Um, so this is pretty simple. Um, in, in fact, we've already been doing it. Um, and so this is nice. Uh, you can combine it with a variety of, uh, like, different meta-learning algorithms. 
Um, but the downside is that you can't actually, this will allow you to reason about uncertainty over the label, but it won't allow you to reason over and about the uncertainty of the underlying function. Uh, and being able to reason about uncertainty of the function is important if you want to understand how to reduce uncertainty across a set of data points. Because um, it could be that you're very uncertain about one data point and you're uncertain, and if you um, had a label for that data point, that would help reduce your uncertainty for a whole host of other data points as well. And so if you had um, some notion about your uncertainty of the underlying function, then you'll understand um, basically how your uncertainty across different data points relates to one another. Um, and then another downside of this is that uh, you can really only capture a limited class of distributions over a Y test. Uh, and this is actually a question that came up after lecture on Monday, which is like, you can output like, um, I've talked about how you can output like a mean variance of a Gaussian over Y test and a categorical distribution. Um, why can't we just output um, some kind of crazy distribution over Y test that looks like something like uh, this? And the challenge that comes up here is if you want to out, if you want this to be kind of your distribution over uh, your labels, given some input, maybe also given your uh, support set, then you need to be able to parameterize this distribution in some way. And parameterizing distributions like this uh, ends up being very difficult. Uh, we know how to parameterize Gaussians as a mean invariance, and we have a nice equation for that, uh, given those two variables. But um, once you have more complex distributions, it's very difficult to parameterize that in a way that uh, is, is differentiable and is, um, is like a, a well-formed function. Cool. Um, yeah, and then the last thing that I'll also mention is that generally if you train a neural network with maximum likelihood, uh, neural networks tend to give you very poorly calibrated uncertainty estimates. And by that I mean that if, it, um, if you have a binary classification problem and it gives you say like a 0 0.9 for one class and a 0 0.1 for another class, uh, Oftentimes, that doesn't mean that it will be correct on this data point with a likelihood of 0 0.9. Um, oftentimes, neural networks tend to be, um, oftentimes they will generally tend to be a little bit more overconfident. Um, but even then, if you, even if you like scale down these um, probability values to try to make them less confident, you're often able, not able to get a, um, an estimate that's actually consistent with the probability that it will be correct on the given data point. Cool. Any questions up until here? What is the estimate of calibration, right? Because it's very subjective that if I feel it should be more uncertain or less uncertain. Yeah, so the question is how do we how do we measure whether or not a neural network is well calibrated? Um, and there's there's a few different ways to do it. Um, I I'll skip ahead actually a little bit to um, one visualization here, um, and well, so yeah, there's a couple different metrics. Um, one metric is called the expected calibration error, um, but something that I think is even more detailed is what's called a reliability diagram, and what this is plotting is um, the x-axis is the confidence that the neural network outputted, and so for here it would say that the confidence is a 0 0.9, and the x-axis is showing the accuracy for all the data points that have a confidence of that particular value. And ideally, you would want this to be uh, a diagonal line, where if you have zero confidence, you have zero accuracy. If you have 50% confidence, you have 50% accuracy, and so forth. And so basically, this is going to be looking at how often do your, do your confidence measures actually match the likelihood of getting it correct in practice. Um, and so the closer to this is to... Um, to a diagonal line, the better your calibration estimates are. Yeah. There are different sources of uncertainty, right? Like maybe there's some true aleatoric uncertainty, like it's impossible to know. And that seems like a kind of accuracy or a kind of a setting where you can make pretty good estimates of your uncertainty. But then there's just your model is wrong, right? It's not an aleatoric thing, it's just like you weren't right. And that's and then that case predicting 
a confidence interval or prediction interval seems sort of like asking just for a better model. Is, is, does that actually work? Yeah, so there's, I guess first to kind of make, make sure everyone's on the same page, there's actually two kinds of uncertainty. Um, one is uncertainty arising from noise in the data itself, like inherent, like there's just um, some noise underlying the like um, the kind of the data generating p of y given x, and that's often referred to as uh, aleatoric uncertainty, or I often like to use maybe something like data uncertainty, um, which I think is a little bit more clear. And then there's a second kind of form of uncertainty that's just whether or not your model is making the correct um, prediction. Uh, and that's often referred to as epistemic uncertainty or, or uh, model uncertainty. And this has to do with um, basically, does your model know what it doesn't know? Uh, and generally, getting good estimates of kind of the uncertainty in the data is easier um, because the, um, you can basically just like look at the data and look at the, like, the frequency at which the label corresponds to a particular value. Whereas it's much harder to get a sense for what your model doesn't know, um, because that would, um, if you could do that, then you could also often get a better model by, when, if you're very confident that you're wrong, then you should just predict something else rather than just um, confidently saying, I know I'm wrong and, and here's a zero confidence estimate. Um, and so generally this kind of uncertainty is much more difficult to get, um, but there, are, and especially with, with things like maximum likelihood, um, there are some ways for, getting this kind of uncertainty. And one thing that we'll talk about a little bit is um, using ensembles. Uh, and in general, this is probably one of the most effective ways to get notions of epistemic uncertainty. Uh, but that is, uh, they're still not very good. Um, and, and, and it is a little bit of a, a paradox, because if, if you could get really good uncertainty estimates, then um, you would also just be able to improve your model. Cool. So, oh, I had a thought exercise. Um, yeah, so we've talked about how we can just have our meta learner output a distribution over y and then train things with maximum likelihood. Um, now, my question for you is instead of having it output a distribution over y, uh, can we have it output? a distribution over phi um, given our training data, and then just train that with maximum likelihood. Does anyone have any thoughts? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so in order to do maximum likelihood on this distribution, you need the ground truth for phi. And we, we have access to ground truth labels, but we don't have access to ground truth phi's. And so for that reason, we can't just do maximum likelihood uh, on this distribution in order to get an estimate of the distribution. Um, and so that's why uh, we need algorithms that are more interesting than maximum likelihood algorithms. Cool. Um, and so to be able to uh, create these kinds of algorithms, we can rely on um, the probabilistic kind of deep learning toolbox. And um, we went into depth on um, on one form of, of tool in the toolbox, which is latent variable models and variational inference on Monday. Um, and this is, we'll kind of primarily focus on using this tool for creating Bayesian meta learning algorithms. Uh, but there are also other tools that we could consider using. Um, and one tool that we will briefly cover is using uh, what's called Bayesian ensembles. Um, and the way that ensembles work is instead of trying to explicitly represent um, some distribution, like output a mean and a variance, um, what it tries to do is it basically tries to represent multiple particles that are samples from that distribution. And the way that you did do this is very, very simple. Um, oftentimes, you just train multiple separate models on your data set. And by training multiple models on your data set with maximum likelihood, that will give you um, kind of multiple copies of your given model. And it turns out that this, um, oftentimes the model that you get will be slightly different from one another, and that will give you um, basically samples from your distribution. 
Um, there's also ways to make this uh, work even better, and we'll also talk about that a little bit. Um, beyond these um, first two things, there's also something called Bayesian neural networks. And the way that these work is um, basically just directly forming a distribution over neural network parameters, um, and, and in particular, usually a Gaussian distribution. And so instead of having a, neural, a single neural network with weights theta, you will have a neural network with a, a mean for your weights and a variance for your weights. And that allows you to form a Gaussian distribution over your, the weights of your neural network. Um, and of course, if you represented a full covariance matrix over the weights of your neural network, then that would be quadratic in the number of parameters that you have. And so that would not be a particularly appealing choice. And so oftentimes, we just pick a single, um, a single scalar variance value for each of the weights. And so um, you're just going to, you'll have one vector that's the same dimension as your weights, which is mu, and another vector that's also the same dimension as your weights, which is sigma. Um, and that allows you to get a fairly simple Gaussian distribution over weight space. Uh, and we'll be, in this lecture, we'll be starting to see things that look kind of like Bayesian neural networks where we have, um, where we are going to be forming kind of Gaussian distributions over, um, over neural network weights. Um, cool. And then I mentioned this a little bit on Monday, but there's also a couple other distribution classes um, such as normalizing flows, um, energy-based models, and GANs. Um, we're not going to really talk about these today, and for the most part, people haven't used these algorithms for, um, in the context of Bayesian meta-learning, uh, but it means that the, um, these other two ways of representing distributions could also be useful for developing new Bayesian meta-learning algorithms. Cool. Um, so now before we, like, I guess sort of one more recap slide before we actually start getting into Bayesian meta-learning algorithms is to try to recap what we covered on Monday. Um, and on Monday, we were talking about uh, trying to represent models, represent distributions using latent variables. And really, the key idea is we're going to have a, a simple distribution of our latent variable z. We're going to then transform that into our, um, our example space x. Um, and so our observed variables x, our latent variable z, and we formulated a lower bound on the log likelihood. And there were a couple of different ways to represent this lower bound. Um, the first was to find, um, was basically expectation of, under Q of log P. Um, so basically trying to find a latent variable value that has maximum probability under P, uh, but then also have an entropy term so that you're covering the distribution accurately and representing that distribution well. Um, and then the second interpretation that we looked at was um, trying to um, have one term that's basically trying to be able to reconstruct examples from encoded latents, um, along with a KL divergence between the inferred latent and the prior. Um, and these two are equivalent, um, and optimizing or maximizing for this objective on the right-hand side is also going to maximize the log likelihood in turn. Um, P corresponds to the model, and P of x given z is represented with a neural network. P of z is represented with a standard normal distribution, um, although in practice you can also learn the prior as well. Um, and then Q is the inference network or the variational distribution, um, which is kind of our approximation of the posterior of z given x. Um, and if we want to sample from this model at test time, we often throw away our inference network um, and only use the model P. Um, and in that sense, it's often primarily used as a tool for, um, for doing inference and for training the model. Um, and we often use theta to denote the, the model parameters and phi to denote the variational parameters. Um, and then the last thing that we talked about was to actually optimize for this objective, we need to be able to optimize with respect to the kind of sampling distribution right here. Um, and the way that we do that is with the reparameterization trick, which um, basically allows us to reparameterize samples from a Gaussian distribution as um, the sum of the mean plus the variance times epsilon. 
uh, where epsilon is an independent random variable. Uh, and this allows us to actually optimize for uh, the parameters of that distribution without, um, um, by kind of decomposing it into these, um, into these two terms. Cool. Um, and so then the big question is if we can use kind of ideas from here for meta-learning. Um, and so uh, as we've uh, sort of hinted at, uh, we can. And so in particular, um, in the context of meta-learning, we are going to have um, our observed variable. Um, in this case, the observed variable will now correspond to the data for a particular task. Um, and so just like uh, kind of when you go from learning to meta-learning, you're kind of treating these data sets as data points. And so kind of the analogy continues there. And then the latent variable uh, will correspond to the task-specific parameters uh, phi i. And once we've defined these two things, then we can basically just um, reuse everything from variational inference that we, caught, that we learned about before, where we can formulate um, kind of lower, a lower bound on the likelihood as an expectation under Q of phi of log P of di given phi i um, minus the KL divergence between Q of phi and um, our prior over phi. And so this is just basically um, rewriting everything on the um, kind of in our evidence lower bound, um, but kind of replacing our observed variable with di and our latent variable with phi i. Yeah? Why are we not writing to like phi given sets? Yeah, so the question was why are we not writing q as phi given d? Um, so I wanted to write it first as this because q can really be conditioned on anything. Um, as we talked about on Monday, uh, uh, it just needs to give you some estimate over phi. And so we have a choice in terms of what we might want to condition Q on. Um, and so we, we can condition it on DI, um, but we may also want to condition it on something else. Uh, and so does anyone have thoughts on what we might condition Q on? Yeah. So the um, the response is we maybe we want to consider conditioning Q on the task or the task representation. So what is the task representation? Um. I feel like it makes sense to condition it on the training set, but I'm not sure. Yeah, so one thing you could do is condition it on the training data set. Um, and this um, and this would basically kind of, um, in some ways, mimic uh, what we saw before, and um, except that now we're actually specifically thinking about DI train here. Uh, and the cool thing about this particular choice is that you can think of this as a neural network that takes as input uh, the training data set and outputs um, a distribution over phi i. And uh, this starts to look a lot like what we saw in black box meta learning, where we're training a neural network to take as input a training data set and output a set of parameters that solves that training data set. And so in many ways, you can think about the kind of this kind of posterior inference process as kind of the inner loop of the meta-learning algorithm. Um, now, one other thing that I'll mention here is that uh, we want to output a distribution over, over phi i. And so um, what we'll actually do is um, 
we can model this as a Gaussian distribution. And so this neural network will actually output um, a mu and a sigma for phi i. Um, and this will be a, kind of a lot like a Bayesian neural network where we're going to be having a kind of, this will represent a Gaussian distribution over the weights for task i. Uh, and this is going to be kind of twice as large as the typical kind of output if we were just outputting a single parameter vector because um, basically the kind of size of mu of phi is going to be equal to kind of the si size of our original space. And similarly, our size over sigma of phi will also be uh, the same as the size of the parameter vector. Cool. Um, and then you can, I guess just to catch up a little bit on the slide. So this is what we wrote down before. We thought about what Q should condition on. And we can have Q condition on our training data. Uh, and then we can view Q as the inner loop process. And then here, when we actually are optimizing for the likelihood under our data for that for task I, um, what we can do is we can specifically pick held out data for this, um, such that this is equal to log P of uh, Y test I given phi I and um, X I test. And this will exactly correspond to what we do in, in the outer loop of the meta-learning algorithm, where we evaluate how good our neural network is, phi i, on making predictions for new, um, new data points. And so this will be, these will be sampled from the query set. Um, and so this is written right here, where basically the training data set is used for the inference process, and the query data set is used um, to evaluate the, um, the likelihood of the data under those parameters. Cool. Um, and then the last question is, uh, where do the meta parameters come into play here? And uh, the natural place for them to come into play, at least insofar as this corresponds to black box meta learning, is right here, um, where basically the meta parameters, you can be, kind of view them as parameterizing this network um, Q. So uh, this neural network has parameters theta. Um, you can also use them in other ways as well. So you can, for example, um, instead of having this uh, be just like a standard Gaussian distribution over parameters, you could actually learn a prior over your parameters. And so this would correspond then to P of phi given theta. And this could be a good choice because regularizing neural network parameters towards a zero mean unit Gaussian distribution, uh, that may not correspond to um, something that's like a very useful uh, set of weights for the network. Um, and so if we introduce the, the kind of meta parameters in the inference network and the prior, then the corresponding equation looks like something like this. Um, I should also mention that you could also incorporate the metaparameters into um, the function that's making predictions as well. Um, in many cases, we haven't done this. But if, for example, you're using an RNN and there's kind of some weight sharing between the metaparameters and the task-specific parameters, then that would kind of come into play here as well. Um, and so for completeness, uh, kind of the final objective looks something like this, where we are, um, we now have kind of a, you have some kind of sum over your tasks i, uh, you're maximizing this with respect to your meta parameters, and you're basically optimizing for um, how well your task parameters solve the task, and also optimizing for your um, your inferred parameters or your kind of your inferred distribution over the task specific parameters matching some prior distribution. Yeah. Question about the modeling choice. So can I choose like the prior over phi as just p of theta? Because in something like mammal, we initialize the parameters with theta, and then basically when we see examples, we like theta kind of serves like a prior, and then you are updating a prior based on like the belief 
or let's say the training that is written then is it like a good way to think about like theta as being a prior for phi? So the question was, um, can we think of, can we, can we just have p of phi just be theta? Um, yeah, so there's a few different ways that you could parameterize this. Um, you could basically just learn a, um, basically have, like, learn a, a, um, a mu theta and a sigma theta that you're basically trying to regularize towards. Um, I wasn't quite sure how this relates to MAML. In this case, we're purely looking at, you can think of this as just a pure black box meta learning approach, and we'll talk about optimization based meta learning approaches in a few slides, but. In a like, traditional use of Bayes, it's like you have a prior belief of your model and then you see data points, right? So I was thinking that initializing the parameter with theta is kind of, you have an initial view of phi that you initialize with theta and then you see data points with the labels and then you kind of tune based on the data points. So it intuitively makes sense to think of theta as a prior over phi uh, in a Bayesian sense. Yeah, so there, um, in something like MAML, it kind of definitely intuitively makes sense to, to actually think of theta as, as a prior, like basically the initial parameters of the prior, and we'll cover that in a couple of slides. There's actually a way to formalize the intuition too, which is pretty cool. Um, cool, so once we formulate this objective, we can then kind of optimize it just like you would optimize a variational autoencoder, um, but uh, instead of having your inference network be over some representation space, it's actually over, over weights. Um, and this allows you to represent um, non-Gaussian distributions over Y-test um, because you now have a, you're kind of ultimately getting a distribution over phi i and then sampling from that distribution um, and so yeah, it has a number of benefits. This is one benefit, and it gives you a distribution over functions rather than um, rather than only a distribution over your labels. Because kind of at the end of this, you um, you you get some kind of estimates for y test, but you also are able to use your inference network to get a distribution over task specific parameters. Um, now, on this note, one thing that I should mention is that. Uh, Unlike in variational autoencoders where you might throw away Q, uh, in this case you won't, you'll actually be using Q at test time. Um, if you want to basically infer like a distribution of your task specific parameters, um, that's exactly what Q is doing in this case. And so uh, the inner loop process is, um, unlike in, in variational autoencoders at test time, you'll first use Q to get phi and then you'll use P to get a distribution over your labels. Um, now, one of the downsides of this approach is, of this approach is that uh, you can only represent Gaussian distributions over phi, uh, and the reason for this is that um, the things like the reparameterization trick and KL divergence um, are primarily applicable to Gaussian distributions, and if you want something that is more expressive than a Gaussian distribution over weights, then it is difficult to apply this sort of framework. To that setting. Um, that said, if you have a large enough neural network, especially a deep enough neural network, then the neural network can, can kind of transform Gaussian samples um, of Gaussian weights into um, something that ends up looking fairly complex. Cool. Um, so that was kind of version one of a Bayesian meta learning algorithm, uh, and it was a black box algorithm. Um, now let's talk a little bit about optimization-based approaches. Uh, and there's, in, in this case, there's really kind of one clear way to apply variational inference to black box methods. Um, but for optimization-based approaches, we're actually going to study three different approaches uh, to Bayesian meta learning algorithms. Um, and before we actually talk about those, th um, those approaches, let's talk a little bit about um, simply just interpreting uh, optimization-based meta learning as um, kind of under a variational model. Uh, and in particular, one intuition that came up before is that uh, if you're running gradient descent, uh, starting from some initial set of parameter vectors, 
or some, of the, some initial set of parameters, uh, doing something like this. You can kind of intuitively think of the initial parameters as a form of prior uh, about the function that you're trying to solve. Um, and if you randomly initialize, that means you have no prior knowledge. Whereas if you kind of initialize as something that you think is pretty close to, to where you might want to go, and you only run a few steps of gradient descent, then that's going to strongly affect the set of parameters that you end up with. And um, it turns out that you can actually formalize that a little bit. Um, and so um, here's a graphical model that's basically the same as um, the one that we saw before. It doesn't split up the train set and the test set, and it doesn't um, kind of separately represent x and y. Um, but otherwise, it corresponds to the same thing that we saw before. And if we're interested in maximizing the log probability of the data, given our metaparameters, you can expand this out following the graphical model to incorporate the latent variable phi, where the log likelihood is equal to the log product of the integral of p of d given phi and p of phi given theta. And then the last step um, is one way that you could try to estimate that integral. So uh, if you have this pretty nasty integral over phi, that means you're integrating over all possible values of your task-specific parameters. So we have p of uh, di given phi i and p of phi i given theta d phi i. Um, one way that you could try to approximate this integral is basically try to find the phi i uh, that has maximum probability. That's the thing that's going to have the most weight, uh, or basically have be the largest term in this integral. And you can very crudely estimate the integral as just taking that map estimate, the thing that has the highest probability, and saying that this is kind of roughly equal to um, the, uh, the value under the particular maximum a posteriori estimate. Oops, no d phi. Um, and the reason why this is kind of interesting to think about is that um, there's a paper that shows in a very um, simplified setting that gradient descent with early stopping corresponds to doing map inference under a Gaussian prior with a mean at the um, initial parameters and a, a variance that depends on a number of different factors, including like the number of gradient steps that you run. And so what this means is that um, insofar as kind of that last line, the map estimate is approximating this integral, um, you can think of an algorithm that runs gradient descent to get the map estimate as something that's approximating the log likelihood. Um, and so if, for example, you run an algorithm like MAML to get, or run an algorithm like gradient descent to get the map estimate and then optimize for the likelihood of the data under that map estimate, which is what MAML does, um, that corresponds to the last equation here. Um, and so the thing that's kind of cool about this is it provides kind of a Bayesian interpretation of what the MAML algorithm is doing. Um, although the thing that's somewhat unsatisfying about this is it doesn't allow us to actually sample from the distribution over task parameters. Um, it kind of allows us to interpret MAML as a kind of a sort of a Bayesian approach, but it kind of almost gets rid of a lot of, like, of the Bayesian part of Bayesian approaches because it doesn't allow us to actually think about this distribution over task specific parameters. Um, and so the next three algorithms that we'll talk about are algorithms that will allow us to actually sample from this distribution rather than using a map estimate. Cool. Um, so the first algorithm that we can think about, um, it will start from the algorithm that we derive in the black box case. And the only thing that will differ is our choice of inference network. And so before our inference network was just a neural network that took as input uh, the 
training data set and output some parameters over, um, so a mean invariance over our task specific parameters. And remember that the, the inference network Q, this variational distribution, it can really be whatever you want it to be. And so one thing that you could do is instead of having it be uh, an inference network like this, um, you could actually kind of embed gradient descent inside of Q. And so what it could look like is you could take, um, start with some set of, uh, some mean invariance. I'll call this mean invariance mu theta and sigma theta. And then what Q could correspond to is kind of running gradient descent with respect to mu theta and gradient descent with respect to sigma theta in order to get mu phi i and sigma phi i. Um, and you could have this, um, this kind of gradient descent process correspond to your inference network Q. And in particular, um, these gradients will be with respect to mu and sigma, um, kind of with respect to the loss for the training data D train I. Um, so Q can be an arbitrary function, and instead of having Q be a neural network, it could include a gradient operator inside of it. Um, and so what you can do is have Q correspond to SGD on the mean invariance of some neural network weights with respect to D train I. Um, and so in this case, uh, the, this will give you a, a kind of a mu and, and, and sigma over phi I. Uh, and kind of once you define this inference network like this, uh, you can kind of, again, reuse all of the same kind of training procedure that we saw before. Yeah? So in this case, instead of you like, actually being a distribution or representing a distribution because previously a tool was a network, now it's just a process that gives you distribution. Yeah, so instead of being a neural network that outputs a distribution, it will be a process that, that still yields a distribution. Um, the... This process does still have some parameters. Um, specifically, it has kind of the initial mu and sigma. Uh, and I call these kind of mu theta and sigma theta kind of in that they sort of signify the initial set of parameters that we saw in an algorithm like MAML. Any other questions? So the only thing that changed, we, we're using kind of the same objective as before. We're just redefining the inference network to have a different form. Um, and this form is analogous to the kind of thing that we saw in optimization-based meta-learning algorithms, where we're basically just stuffing gradient descent inside of our inference network and actually having gradient descent correspond to um, what happens inside. The other thing that's, um, that's different about optimization, like kind of a standard mammal algorithm, is that our meta-parameters now we're going to correspond to both mu and sigma here. Um, and so we'll have, uh, we won't just have a um, kind of a single theta vector, we'll have uh, two of these theta vectors, one that corresponds to the mean and one that corresponds to the variance. Um, now the cool thing about this is that at test time, once we want to do inference to infer our task specific parameters, we're just going to be running gradient descent at test time. So instead of uh, doing inference by passing it through a neural network to get our task-specific parameters or our distribution over the task-specific parameters, we're going to be running gradient descent. Um, this means that we should be um, kind of a little bit more robust to tasks that are a little bit out of distribution at test time. Um, the downside of this is that we are, um, similar to before, going to end up with a Gaussian distribution over our task-specific parameters. 
And this means that if we wanted to represent a more complex distribution over our task specific parameters, uh, we would be out of luck in that case. And it's again kind of important for it to be Gaussian uh, for two reasons. One, that allows us to evaluate the KL divergence in closed form. And second, um, it allows us to use the reparameterization trick to backprop into this. So when we, um, when we sample from Q, uh, when we sample a phi from Q, we're going to be sampling a phi from a Gaussian distribution parameterized by mu phi and, um, and sigma phi. And we can, again, use the same kind of reparameterization trick and have this be equal to mu phi plus epsilon times sigma phi, where epsilon is sampled from a, uh, a Gaussian with mean zero and unit variance. And by making this a Gaussian distribution, that allows us to use this reparameterization trick and backprop into, um, into uh, mu phi and sigma i, but also backprop all the way back into mu theta and sigma theta. Yeah. In general, the meta parameters can be more than like the initialization as like the learning rate and like optimization procedure, et cetera, et cetera. So that still like fits into this frame, right? That doesn't uh, that tends to frame, but I just wanted to confirm that still. Yeah, so the question was um, in general, in optimization based meta learning, the meta parameters can correspond to not just the initialization but other things like the learning rate and so forth. And yeah, that also fits well into this framework. So um, here I'm writing kind of mu theta and sigma theta as the main meta parameters. Uh, but you could also optimize um, other things. And so, for example, um, you could optimize the learning rate here uh, and have that be a part of the meta parameters as well. Cool. Um, so then there's a question of whether we can model a non-Gaussian posterior. And we'll look at two different approaches for doing this. Um, the first is what will be to use ensembles. Um, and in particular, what we can do is uh, if we want to get a kind of a, a distribution over phi i, uh, we can basically just train an ensemble of mammals uh, and specifically just train m independent mammal models, um, train them independently with different mini batches of tasks and so forth. Uh, to get an ensemble of mammals. And um, it's also worth noting that you can use ensembles with kind of black box or non-parametric methods as well. And this will also give you, um, in some sense, a distribution over metaparameters. And so this will give you a distribution over metaparameters. And then when you run gradient descent, starting from those initializations, you'll also get a distribution over phi i. Um, one challenge with ensembles is that if you just train independently, oftentimes training will result in a set of parameters or metaparameters that are very similar to one another. And one approach for dealing with this is to try to more actively diversify the weights that you get um, and try to kind of optimize for a more diverse ensemble of mammals. And so the way that this can work is um, there's actually a kind of, a, rather than just kind of crudely trying to say, oh, the, the parameter vector should be independent. Um, there's something called uh, Stein variational gradient descent uh, that actually actively pushes particles away from each other with a particular choice of kernel. And so the way that this method is going to work is when we run gradient descent in the inner loop, we are not just going to run gradient descent on our, on our support set. So. Typically, we'll do something like uh, theta minus alpha grad theta L of um, theta with respect to D train. And then this will be kind of, this will correspond to phi i. And what we're going to do that's a little bit different is we're going to say that we want, um, we want phi i to be kind of different from the other members of our ensemble. And so we're going to optimize for multiple uh, kind of multiple particles, and so I'll use m to denote the kind of the particle number. And we're going to additionally have a term that, um, that says that we want, 
we want to kind of push away the value of our parameters um, and make it different from other values. And so we can measure kind of this the diff or the distance between um, our current parameters that we're optimizing and the uh, the values um, the kind of the other particles that are different for like m prime not equal to m uh, for that particular task. And so this is what the inner loop is going to look like. Um, and then the outer loop will be uh, basically just the same as before. Um, the equations for here are just copied from the paper and so they use slightly different notation. Um, but the outer loop is just going to correspond to um, optimizing for the likelihood of phi i on the, um, on the test set for task i. And you're going to be doing this for all of the different parameters. And so you're going to sum over both the tasks i as well as the um, ensemble members. Cool. And so the only thing really here that's changing is first that we're going to be optimized, we're going to have kind of multiple particles that we're optimizing for in the inner loop. And we're going to push them apart by ha adding this additional term in our inner loop objective. Yeah. Yeah, the question is what kind of kernels are most useful here? Um, I can't actually remember exactly what they used in the paper here. I think that typically something just like a, um, looking at the uh, like Euclidean distance um, is reasonable here. I do think that, that distances in parameter space are not always a good function of kind of functional similarity um, because you can, if there are some parts of the weight vector that are just not used by the network, then you can push those parts away a lot and just kind of ignore the other parts. And that will lead to two functions that are very different in weight space, but are identically functionally. Um, and so you want your kernel to, um, to try to pay, pay attention to all of the parameters in the parameter vector to try to prevent that case. Um, and if you can measure some notion of functionality, um, for example, looking at something like the Fisher information matrix or something like that, then that may lead to better performance. Um, but those measures often end up being computationally expensive or crude estimates of something that's comp computationally expensive. Yeah? The time procedure will be different from the inner loop, right? Because we won't be doing, like, uh, we don't have a clear commander set of anybody more than that. Do we have it? Um, so you're saying that what happens at meta test time might be different? Or? So at meta test time, you actually also run the same inner loop as well. Um, and so you, basically what you want to happen is you'll have this kind of a single set of initial parameters and you'll want to try to like have this lead to multiple um, task specific parameters for that task. And this will basically um, represent samples from P i of theta given, um, P, sorry, P i, or P of phi i given theta and D train i. And so just like before, um, we were on the whiteboard that's behind it, um, we were getting this sort of distribution with our inference network. In this case, we're representing this distribution with um, these different kind of samples or these different ensemble members. Cool. Um, so the benefit of this sort of approach is it's pretty simple to implement. Um, it tends to work pretty well. Uh, ensembles especially are, are one of the most effective methods for model uncertainty or epistemic uncertainty. And it also can give you non-Gaussian distributions. Like the, the phi i that you end up with, these could be samples from a distribution that's much more complex than a Gaussian distribution. Um, the downside is that you do need to maintain m different model instances, and this can get pretty expensive at times. Um, but one way to try to mitigate this is to do gradient based, to do gradient descent only on the last layer, and then you only have to maintain m different copies of the last layer rather than m, di m different copies of the entire network. <laughs> 
Cool. Um, now from there we'll cover one more Bayesian meta-learning algorithm which tries to give us kind of a non-Gaussian distribution over all of the parameters in a way that's a bit cheaper than maintaining m different copies. Um, and some of the intuition behind this last approach is to try to sample parameter vectors with a procedure that looks a little bit like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And the way that Hamiltonian Monte Carlo works is you typically kind of first add noise to your parameters and then run gradient descent on your parameters in order to um, it typically actually iterate that process in order to ultimately um, draw samples from some distribution. And kind of some of the intuition behind this is we, um, we're gonna try to learn a prior where if we kind of randomly kind of kick the parameters or randomly add noise to the parameters, that will put us in different modes of the distribution. Um, and so if we think about the kind of example that we talked about before where different attributes would correspond to different classifiers. Um, for example, if we wanted to learn a classifier for smiling or wearing a hat versus a classifier for smiling and young, um, we'd like to learn a, a prior theta where if we add noise um, in one direction, it puts us in kind of one basin and if we add noise in the other, it kind of puts us in a different mode. And so um, ideally we'd like to be able to learn a theta such that if we add noise and then run gradient descent, we'll get different, um, different samples from this distribution that end up being uh, classifiers that, are, um, that correspond to like these different modes of the distribution. Um, so that's the kind of high level intuition. In terms of how we might actually do this, um, first we're actually going to have a distribution over our meta parameters. Uh, this is gonna be different from the things that we saw before. Um, before we just had a single vector of meta parameters that were basically parameterizing our prior and our inference network. And here we're going to actually also have a kind of a distribution over these meta parameters. Um, and then we're going to also um, have a distribution of phi i given theta. Um, and our goal will be to sample from the posterior of phi i given the support set and the test example. We'd like to also be able to sample from this distribution without the test example. So in practice, we can observe the test example. Um, and that distribution up there corresponds to kind of inferring phi i from everything that we can observe. Um, although in practice it'd be nice if we had kind of a single parameter vector that worked well for any test example, not just um, the test example that is observed at any given point in time. And then from there we can write down our distribution over phi i as um, again kind of the product of p of theta, p of phi i given theta, and then p of y train given x train and phi i. And then of course, um, in this case, integrating out theta. Um, so this is just the product of the, the distributions that underlie this graphical model. Um, but of course, uh, this integral, like many of the other integrals that we've seen in the class, is completely intractable because it has to integrate out over, um, over like kind of all the parameters in this Gaussian distribution. And so the last way that we're going to try to deal with an intra intractable integral in this case is, um, is trying to crudely estimate this distribution right here of phi i given theta and x train y train. And if we did know this distribution, then sampling would be much, kind of inferring phi i given x train and y train would be much easier. Because what we could do is we could first sample theta and then sample from this distribution right here. Um, we can just, and that's, that's what's called ancestral sampling where you sample one and then sample from the next distribution. And it would basically transform our graphical model into this one where you first sample from theta and then we sample from the distribution that um, feeds into phi i. And that would give us a sample from um, the kind of distribution of p phi i given x train and y train. Um, now, of course, we don't actually know this distribution of p of phi i given theta and x train y train. But what we could do is we could try to estimate this as a map estimate 
just like we saw in the kind of Bayesian interpretation of MAML when we first started talking about optimization-based Bayesian meta-learning algorithms. Um, and the map estimate um, is a crude estimate of this distribution. Uh, it's only giving you the mode of this distribution rather than a sample from the distribution. But it's also a very convenient um, approximation to this distribution because once we have this, um, this approximation, then we can just, um, then it's very easy to sample from P of phi i. Um, and in particular, once we approximate this with map inference and specifically with um, a few steps of gradient descent, then at test time what happens is we will basically first sample from theta and then to sample, th then next we want to sample from P of phi given theta and di train. And to do this, we'll then kind of take the sample that we took um, and then kind of very crudely approximate this as running gradient descent starting from the sample. Maybe I'll denote this as theta prime just to differentiate from P of theta. Um, and then we're going to run gradient descent um, on DI train. And this kind of corresponds exactly to the procedure that we saw on the previous slide where we first sample and then run gradient descent. Um, and then sampling is easy. Um, how, what about training? Uh, you can also actually just train this with amortized variational inference. Um, I'm going to skip the exact training procedure uh, for the sake of time, but if you're interested in learning more, you could, we can talk about it in office hours or um, you could take a look at the paper. Um, and so kind of again, um, kind of sampling from P of theta and then running gradient descent looks like what we talked about before. Um, in particular, sampling from P of theta corresponds to um, basically taking mu theta and then adding noise corresponding and multiplying that noise by the variance. And so that will uh, correspond to basically adding noise to, to mu theta. And then step two corresponds to running gradient descent, which will um, kind of hopefully get us into these two modes of the distribution or, or ideally more than two, just two modes of the distribution if we have more ambiguity than that. Do you have a question? Um, I think I just, um, so, so what do you mean by like taking us into the two different phases? Does it mean two copies? Or do you just like do the process twice? Right, so the question is, um, does this mean that we're keeping two copies or are we, or are we doing the process twice? Um, so, yeah, so if we, our goal is really to sample from um, P of phi, uh, kind of sample from, be able to sample multiple different task specific parameters. And the way that we'll do that is we will just repeat this process multiple times depending on the number of samples that we want. And so if we wanna see, um, if we think that there might be, well, yeah, it basically just corresponds to the number of samples that you want. Um, you might start by like collecting like five samples, for example, by adding noise and then running gradient descent and repeating that five times to get five different classifiers. Uh, and if you see that you have a lot of variance among your five different classifiers, then you could continue to sample other classifiers um, from there. Um, the upside of this is that it will give you a non-Gaussian posterior. It's um, fairly simple at test time. You just add noise and run gradient descent. Um, you also only need to train um, one, um, one model instance. Uh, the downside is that it leads to a more complex training or meta training procedure. Yeah. So then we sample multiple thetas because then only then we will be able to enter multiple basins. It's the standard, right, which basin you're entering. So you said only one. That was a bit confusing. Like, shouldn't you have multiple like, samples of theta and then do it, like, then ensemble the prediction? Yeah, so to sample multiple, to, to generate multiple samples from phi, you'll sample multiple thetas and run gradient descent from each of those thetas. 
It's just you need only one model instance. Um, oh, sorry, you only need one meta training model instance. Whereas when you train an ensemble of mammals, you'll need um, kind of multiple copies of the meta parameters. Cool. Um, so to summarize all the methods that we've talked about, uh, V0 was just to output a distribution over Y test, uh, which is simple, but it can't reason about uncertainty over function space. And then all the methods that we talked about after V0 were actually giving us distributions over classifiers or distribution over predictors. Um, we talked about a black box approach that used kind of a latent variable model over phi with amortized variational inference. And this allowed us to um, represent non-Gaussian distributions over Y, um, but was restricted to Gaussian distributions over phi. Um, and then we also talked about three different optimization-based meta-learning algorithms. Um, the first was just to uh, kind of stuff gradient descent into our inference network. Uh, and this was pretty simple. It was a very simple modification of the black box approach. Um, but it meant that P of phi given theta had to be modeled as a Gaussian. We also talked about an ensemble, which is pretty simple. Um, it can model non-Gaussian distributions, but requires multiple model instances. And then um, the um, kind of the more hybrid approach that we talked about that was combining this map estimate and um, variational inference can give you a non-Gaussian posterior, um, but involves a more complex training procedure. Um, in the last five minutes, I'd like to talk a little bit about evaluation of these approaches. Um, one thing that you could consider doing is to try to use standard benchmarks like mini ImageNet or OmniGlot. And these are standardized and have real images and they're a good check that your Bayesian meta-learning approach didn't break the meta-learning algorithm that you had before. Uh, but they aren't really the best metric of how good your Bayesian meta-learning algorithm is. Um, First, metrics like accuracy won't evaluate whether your uncertainty estimates are calibrated. And second, the tasks may not actually exhibit that much ambiguity. And so it may not stress test your ability to actually model distributions over task parameters. Um, and then lastly, it may also be that uncertainty just isn't useful on those data sets. And it's good to actually evaluate algorithms and settings where they might be practically useful. Um, so what about better problems and metrics? So it really depends on what you might care about. Um, so one thing that you could look at that is, uh, that I think is kind of nice because you can actually just visualize the functions that it's learning is to look at um, some ambiguous problems in like one or two dimensions and actually visualize the functions that it gives you. Um, so this is a few shot regression problem where the purple triangles correspond to the support examples. And um, the, the tasks correspond to either sinusoids or linear functions. And some of the tasks, there's very little ambiguity. Um, and other tasks, there's actually a lot more ambiguity. So the middle function, for example, is something where um, it could actually correspond to either a linear function or a sinusoid. And you see that the, the kind of the process that samples these functions will actually give you, um, sometimes give you linear functions and sometimes give you sinusoidal functions. Um, you could also formulate an ambiguous classification task. Um, this is a setting where all of the tasks corresponded to these circular decision boundaries. And the algorithm is actually only given one example in the support set, just one positive example that's indicated by um, the green plus sign. And that green plus sign may be anywhere within the decision boundary. And you see that uh, these dashed lines are showing the decision boundaries corresponding to the functions phi i that you're sampling. And you can see uh, kind of visually that it's giving you a fairly diverse sample of these functions. Um, so this is one kind of toy visualization that gives you a lot of, um, gives you the ability to kind of interpret what's going on. Uh, but it's also very toy. Um, another thing that you could look at is trying to generate, uh, trying to look at ambiguous generation tasks. So this is something where the goal is to learn a generative model over different viewpoints of an object. And it's given only one, uh, one viewpoint in the support set, which is shown on the left. And the goal is to generate lots of other viewpoints, which is shown um, in the middle of the slide. Um, and here you can actually just look at the, the samples in comparison to a CVAE. This 
Bayesian meta-learning algorithm called Versa, which is a lot like the black box approach that we talked about, is much better able to um, kind of generate samples uh, from the distribution. And it also gives you um, kind of a lower mean squared error and a lower um, SSIM, which is another measure of reconstruction error. Or sorry, actually a, a higher SSIM, which is you want to be higher on SSIM metrics. Um, a third thing that you could look at is looking at both accuracy as well as mode coverage and likelihood. Um, and so you can take this lab egg task that we saw earlier um, where they're kind of purposely ambiguous. Uh, some tasks, basically kind of the support set is not enough information to figure out what the positive examples and negative examples should be. And um, there's a number of metrics that you can look at in combination. One is just accuracy uh, on classifying new examples. But you can also look at, um, you can also measure like, there's three possible classifiers for it to consider um, that are kind of, in this case, visualized um, in B. And you can try to see, is it learning all three of those classifiers? Uh, and we see in this example, um, the kind of the, um, everything with the pink box is showing things that were classified as positive by the classifier. And you can see that it does actually give you three classifiers that more or less, in this case, cover the three um, kind of ground truth classifiers underlying that data. Um, and then you can also look at kind of average negative log likelihood. Yeah? For the generation task, there's maybe more than one dimension of uncertainty. Like there are lots of ways that you could be uncertain about whether your image is right. And are there interesting trade-offs there? Like do these models have different, are they uncertain in different ways basically? Um, so the question was the, like there's multiple possible dimensions of ambiguity in tasks like this. And are there different trade-offs that models can make? Um, I, I guess, I do think that different algorithms will have different properties. Um, I certainly think that there are like things like Versa are kind of strictly better than CVAE in this case. Um, I haven't, I don't know of any kind of examples off the top of my head of kind of interesting trade-offs between algorithms, but um, I can think about it and yeah. A number, if you know, you collapse all of it into one. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I actually wanted to provide in these slides is that sometimes the numbers, they don't actually tell you that much about what's actually going on. And so actually making these kinds of visualizations, I think is really helpful for understanding um, kind of what's beyond the number, basically. Um, and I guess it's also, I think, useful to be kind of creative about the numbers that you measure because um, when you do a look at the data and kind of notice different things, you can try to actually come up with metrics like coverage, like what are the kind of number of classifiers that you're representing that do actually capture the kinds of things that you might want to see. Um, and I guess in, um, the, in this example, it is actually possible to get kind of classifiers that have very low coverage, but pretty high accuracy. And likewise, things that have really good coverage, but slightly lower accuracy. And that is one example of a trade-off that you can make depending on kind of the hyperparameters of the algorithm. Cool, um, and the last, met or actually no, second to last one is reliability diagrams, which we actually already talked about. Um, and then the last thing you can look at is active learning settings, which is if you give it, if you allow it to actively query a few additional data points, how much does the accuracy drop, or sorry, how much does the error drop and how much does the accuracy increase? Um, and you can see that, uh, kind of Bayesian meta-learning algorithms, um, some, like some of the ones that we saw today, uh, are able to kind of drop the error rate and increase the accuracy faster than an algorithm that, um, that kind of chooses data points at random or an algorithm that doesn't have good estimates of uncertainty. Cool. Um, so yeah, that's it for today. Uh, we talked about Bayesian meta-learning algorithms and kind of techniques for representing uncertainty over parameters. Um, next week, we're going to talk about domain adaptation and domain generalization, which is a pretty cool special case of kind of the multitask and meta-learning problem setting. Um, the following week, we'll um, kind of have our last kind of, I don't know, main technical lecture, I guess, on lifelong learning. And then we'll start to have uh, two guest lectures and kind of a, a final lecture on kind of open problems and feature directions. Um, 
before that last week, we're going to have Thanksgiving, um, so we can eat some turkey. And um, yeah, as a reminder, homework uh, three is due on Friday.